Right, so I added to my title a little subtitle, Triple Helix. And Triple Helix is something we invented in Glasgow uh, to describe very, very important collaboration between academia, NHS, and industry. And I think precision medicine, which I believe is going to change the way we practice medical research and medical practice and health delivery uh, is really very much based on this triple helix. It's not something we can do in ivory towers, not even in Oxford. But to do any innovation, I believe we need excellence. And um, there are trials somewhere all over the world, I think, but particularly here in the UK, to say innovation and research are not really connected. You can do fabulous innovation without having excellent research background in your discipline. And I think this is not true. So in that you have to have excellence, this is my bragging slide, yeah? So you see here that in 2018, um, Biomedicine in Glasgow, as judged by a very important uh, league table, it was sandwiched between Oxford and Cambridge. And this is the highest we've ever been. And it's been a huge pride and joy for me. And to show it in Oxford is particular pleasure. So uh, I know now, because we now have results for 2019, Oxford is still first, Glasgow is still second. But Cambridge, sorry to say, went down to five. Now, on a, on a serious note, um, on a serious note, um, the University of Glasgow, in addition to this, you know, striving to be good and to compete with the best and striving for excellence, also we have come up with six, six research beacons. And I am delighted and I participated in debate that three of these research beacons are within the broad biomedical area. Uh, and the biggest and most important of them all is precision medicine. And you see here, we call it precision medicine and chronic diseases. We've raised a lot of money from variety of places, including this very important source of funding that we're very worried, of course, now about, as you can imagine. Um, and we also managed in UK-wide competition to have the first ever, directly from the Queen, the Regius Chair in Precision Medicine. There is only one like it, and we got it a year ago, and it's still vacant. I am looking, it's, the letter from the Queen is lying on my desk, and I am looking for a worthy candidate. So if you can very, very quickly do a lot of work in machine learning and AI as applied to precision medicine, let me know. Now, um, this is our new hospital where everything happens. It is called Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. You see that I'm a bit of a royalist. And um, it is a one billion pounds Scottish government built NHS hospital, not a PFI, we don't need to pay anything back. And we have been able, we've had an opportunity to build clinical academic campus there that is really dedicated to precision medicine. And that's been a great opportunity and that's last four years of work that's been great fun to do. And the philosophy of this work has been this triple helix. The university leads but working very, very closely and in tandem with NHS and industry. And I think in some way this is beyond pure research. This is truly applied. This is ready to go to patients. And I'll try to prove it to you as, as we go along. So this is my definition of precision medicine. It's a bit of a hype. You know that science all over the world likes hype and hype is dangerous because sometimes people promise too much, do not deliver, and things go downhill quickly. And in my lifetime in biomedicine, 
the great example of this was gene therapy. You're probably too young to remember, but some people in the audience would know that it promised everything. It's still there, it's doing good things, but it doesn't deliver everything to everybody. So this is my definition, precise definition of precision medicine. The old fashioned medicine uses names of diseases as they were 100 years ago and assumes that everybody is the same and needs the same treatment. And that, of course, is not true. For the last 20 years, we've been doing fantastic molecular medicine, DNA sequencing, other omics, I'll illustrate in a minute. And we can substratify almost every common chronic disease in the world, including cancers. And by this substratification, as illustrated here, and we use all the tools of the trade, old-fashioned clinical examinations that Americans forgotten to do many years ago, yeah? And British medicine is wonderful because we still talk to patients and examine them, don't put them into the machine, but also very precise medical imaging, genetic and molecular medicine, as I mentioned, but also looking how patients, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of patients respond to treatment. And all this allows us to stratify every chronic disease and cancer, as I said, and that leads to better, earlier, more precise diagnosis, ability to prognosticate, and to define response to treatment before you prescribe. Not after things go wrong, but before you prescribe drugs. Also, by understanding the mechanism of disease in great detail, we find new druggable targets. So it is also about drug discovery, not only, but also, and therefore industry likes to join in. Okay, now, as I already said, you need everybody to come together. No single group of people, however clever, can deliver this. And you need patients to join in. Without patients' trust, precision medicine is not going to happen. Now, why Scotland is particularly well positioned to do it? There are many reasons, but the main one is very good and very well developed and very trustworthy electronic health records, which we've had for 30 years. Everybody who lives in Scotland, whether born there or not, has a community health index. The moment you see general practitioner for the first time, you acquire community health index. That goes with you from pre-birth to this other less successful end of medical life. Um, and it, it's all linkable because this is a unique identifier. There isn't anything like that going back 30 years in other countries, not even in the rest of the UK, although people are trying to develop similar things. Now, the second thing is the molecular medicine and the omics. And there was a little bit about this yesterday. I heard some talks that talked about paradigm of precision medicine. I absolutely agree. Um, but what happened over the last decade, and Glasgow being part of this, is that all these new molecular technologies are ready, reproducible enough and precise enough to go to the clinic, to move into clinical laboratory from research laboratory. So we have been working with the Wellcome Trust and funding 50-50, what we call Glasgow Polyomics. There are other similar initiatives around the UK and elsewhere in the world. Uh, we've been able to bring people from industry uh, because welcome pays more than other bodies, yeah? We've been able to develop platforms, very modern platforms that are ready for the prime time with patients. And this is really, really important for good precision medicine. And with these good things in Scotland, uh, some four years ago, we competed with other industrial groups or industry-linked groups, for example, you know, renewable energy and others, and we won funding for an innovation center, but it was only one because industry, particularly these two companies in the center, put their own money on the table, and that leveraged about 20 million of 
public money, of government money, to fund the innovation center. And you see here six disease groups, three are cancers and three are inflammatory disorders that have been selected as exemplars to show that precision medicine actually could deliver what we're promising to deliver. These exemplars are almost there. Three of those have been extremely successful and two are already in clinical practice, pancreatic cancer and ovarian cancer. Rheumatoid arthritis, a very severe and pleasant inflammatory disorder, is also very close to clinical agenda, to clinical practice already. So it can be done, but of course, as usually, more is needed. You remember that in my definition, imaging was an extremely important part. And, you know, it's logical, isn't it? If you want to diagnose disease very early and better, you need fantastic modern imaging. And we've created this by raising a lot of money. Um, for example, we have one of only five in this country, seven Tesla MRI scanners, magnetic resonance imaging scanners that give a de detailed definition of imaging we've never seen before. And that's particularly important for brain disorders, for stroke, for small vessel disease in the brain, for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, etc. So very, very high fidelity, um, precise imaging. And we built whole building around this scanner, and this has become Imaging Center of Excellence, ICE, where academia, industry, and NHS works together, seamlessly together. It's been designed by architects in such a way that people have to bump into each other and talk to each other. It's a fabulous building. If you're in Glasgow, come and have a look. Um, we've also created what we call Clinical Innovation Zone, which is dedicated to industry. And it's in two buildings, linked through the corridor. One is the ICE, and another is actually teaching and learning building. And this is 22,000 square feet, for those who think in feet. Um, 22,000 square feet of space, a lot of space, which we have funding to build laboratories, either wet or dry. Majority of firms actually want dry laboratories nowadays just for high-level computing, machine learning, etc. And you see some companies that have already have collocated with us, and we have a list of those who are awaiting collocation, and by January will be completely full. So this idea of embedding industry amongst the NHS clinicians and clinical academics has worked a treat. That's where they want to be. People talk about white coat distance, although, as you know, we no longer wear white coats in hospitals because of the, uh, the worry that they carry bags, yeah, carry bacteria. They, they still talk in industry about white coat distance. The shortest the distance, the better for the company. And I think now this bit is probably the most important going into the future. I had a question from one of the colleagues uh, here as I was putting my slides. Is machine learning and AI important? Hugely. Actually, this is the key. And if any of you are in this area and would like to work in health, please, please come to Glasgow. We don't have enough people in this area. So we have built Safe Heaven first in Glasgow and now three others across Scotland. And the safe heaven is an idea, a mechanism to protect patients' data, never to leak a name or date of birth, and we've never done, to preserve the trust our patients place in us, and yet to be able to use thousands of data points in order to improve our diagnostic abilities. And you see here, this has been developed by Canon and their head for uh, Scotland and Europe. And you see here that there is data controller, Caldicott Guardian. This is a Scottish way of preserving uh, the data security. Here you have sets of data. So this is radiology, completely digitalized for whole Scotland. 
every X-ray, every scan, every CT, every MRI is digitalized almost immediately after it's done. Other data, routine clinical data, analyzed through safe heaven, anonymized into this data portal, and then machine learning could happen in a completely safe way. This line divides that activity, which is all in the NHS and never leaves the NHS, with companies, big and small, it could be Canon, which is a big international company, but it could be small, medium enterprise company of two young computer scientists who have great ideas. They are now able to use these data, produce algorithm using AI, and if they are really, really clever, this algorithm now is protected, it has IP, it doesn't, it no longer belongs to the NHS, we hope it will go back cheaply or for free into the NHS to be tested, but it can also be sold all over the world if this is the way to diagnose some difficult disorder. And that allows the companies to see that they would benefit, that there would be a profit. I think this is great. We can now test it because we've just been funded on the 6th of November and this is funding for whole Scotland, but with the hub in our ICE building. This is called iCared, not iCard, iCared. There is apparently some Celtic word, which I cannot quite um, tell you where it comes from. Uh, but as you see, this will work Scotland-wide. We'll have lots of participants but it will deliver this idea of machine learning and AI for better healthcare, for better precision medicine. And it tackles two areas, digital radiology and digital pathology. There are four other centers around the UK. They will all work together, but we hear that Scottish Centre is the most advanced because of our electronic health data. And also we're the only ones who tackle both radiology and pathology. Others only do one of the two. So here we go. So if you imagine a, a doctor, I don't think it's really future vision or long-term vision, vision. I think it's happening today, at least in cancer. I'll take you in a minute quickly through cardiovascular disease that is a bit behind. But in cancer, this is already happening. So this is picture of DNA sequencing of the tumor. It happens to be pancreatic cancer, which was one of our exemplars that delivered clinically. This is peripheral blood. Next generation sequencing shows actionable mutations, mutations that will lead to a cocktail of drugs best for this particular patient. You will have all imaging, you can think about all pathology, but also all routine data that NHS does all the time. And all this, we hope, will be on the computer screen in front of the oncologist looking after the patient let's say, in a week after presentation. Very quickly, as you know, very frequently, as you know, in, in cancer, time matters, yes? You need to start treatment very quickly. And this is the vision of precision medicine, not only in cancer, maybe not so fast, also in other conditions. So what frequent criticism of all this is that it will cost so much that it will bankrupt the NHS or all other health systems. And this is a nonsense because actually doing things better is more economical and we will save money. So this is one of many health economic analysis. This is modeling based on real Scottish data. So Scottish burden of disease gives us the data of these five groups of chronic common diseases as illustrated here. And we could see that if we implement tools of precision medicine, even 10% reduction of burden of disease, and we hope we can do more, would save the NHS in blue here billions. The problem in this particular modeling is that it talks about 50 years hence. 
And if you speak to politicians, as you know, 50 years is too long. This doesn't help the election in a few years. So we've redone this health economics and we now have very similar data for five and 10 years. And I hope it will come out in a short um, article in the Times, Scottish edition, next week. So we could show similar billions of pounds of saving for the NHS on a shorter period of time. And this is because we will save on the drug bill, but also on unnecessary admissions due to adverse reactions to drugs. Drugs prescribed without precision medicine are prescribed as trial and error and frequently do more harm than good, which is not a good way to practice modern medicine. So I think I persuaded you that we've got an ecosystem. We would love to extend it for the rest of the UK, Europe, if we allowed, the world, uh, because it's a good stuff to do. But you see here that you need a huge number of partners. You need quite a complicated ecosystem to deliver this, but you need a door. And we propose that our center, that what we've built in Glasgow, could be a door that will then connect with the right company, right group of academics, right group of NHS people to deliver precision medicine for patients. So it's a bit of altruistic sort of activity, if you believe me. Now, is it that we just praise ourselves and stay in our little uh, place there saying how wonderful we are? Well, not quite. Uh, there was a couple of years ago a report so-called WISH report uh, that went to all ministers of health all over the world, so world report. And uh, our ecosystem was given as an example how this can be delivered. Uh, clearly, we've moved over the last two years forward, and hopefully there will be another report and we'll have a chance to contribute to it again, because this is a very quickly moving field, in my view. Now, between now and, and another few minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so, I would like to show you my area of research that I spent my life developing, but it has been really slow to introduce precision medicine to cardiovascular medicine because there is no tumor, there is no tissue, it's much more difficult, there is no inflammation, there is no cancer. So, We've been discovering genes that cause blood pressure to go up. You know that some 40% of adults in developed countries and increasingly in low and middle income countries too, have high blood pressure. It's a huge risk for stroke, for heart attacks, and we're not doing well enough preventing it, despite some 50 or more drug classes that have been discovered. So when we treat high blood pressure as one disease, we have all these genes, but we're not conquering the, the risk factor. We're not winning for some reason. So over the last decade or so, there have been lots of studies to try to utilize modern molecular medicine, particularly genomics, DNA sequencing, to do better in hypertension. And you see example of this here. So this is a classic, some of you maybe participated in this type of studies. This is a classic genome-wide association study. It uses thousands of cases and controls, sometimes hundreds of thousands, sometimes a million, and I'll show you the biggest one of all. Uh, it uses the SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are markers across the entire genome and now we have huge number, very dense maps of the SNPs. SNPs are just markers of the genome. They don't tell us about function, but they allow us to find regions in the genome that contribute to the disease. And you see that we now have five million of those in the best, most recent studies. We come with top hits. They look like this, Manhattan plot. You see why Manhattan, the higher the the high rises, the more significant, the lower the p-value. I'll show it to you in a minute more. You then need to replicate in another population. And then you have your real hits with very low p-values. And you can do functional studies in animal models mostly, or in vit vitro, 
or you can do risk prediction on the real patients. And I'll show you examples of all of this and you'll be critical and tell me whether this enormous effort has helped patients much yet. So this is the oldest of these, or the, the first positive, let's put it that way, published in Nature, many, many groups, more than 100 authors, and you see that 29 regions were significantly associated with blood pressure, systolic on the top, diastolic, you know there are two numbers, systolic, diastolic, when you measure blood pressure, or binary hypertension, yes or no. Here are all the SNPs, individual SNPs contribute about one millimeter mercury to your systolic in red, 0.5 millimeter mercury to your diastolic pressure, sounds very small, but if you choose your parents incorrectly, yes, and we don't choose our parents normally, so if you, if you had bad luck and inherited all those going the wrong direction, the difference in blood pressure is really large, 35 millimeters mercury, yeah? So that's highly significant. Okay, so you can now calculate risk score in somebody very young, yeah, because you know your DNA, and you can see what we've expected, that the so-called left ventricular hypertrophy, the hypertrophy of the wall of the heart that pumps the blood, very highly related to this genetic risk, risk score, so is stroke, terrible, devastating complication of hypertension, but even more so coronary artery disease that leads to myocardial infarctions. So we're learning things. We can predict things better than without this genetic risk score. Uh, now, many, many years, and I think probably 50 such studies published in, first in Nature, then in Nature Genetics, and now in lower impact factor journals, uh, and here is the biggest of them all, and that was just a few months ago, so 2018. And look at this, one million people studied all together in one study, an enormous effort of huge international collaboration. And 535 of these loci have been discovered, huge number. But sometimes which huge number, very difficult to use it clinically. Which ones do you choose? Where do you do animal experiments? You can't do 535 animal experiments, impossible. So here it shows the Manhattan plot. You see it's very, very dense here. And on the Manhattan plot, maybe I should have orient oriented you before. So as you go up, this is cut off at p-value minus 35, yeah? Those of you who do biomedical research know that P below 005 is normally enough. It's not enough here because we do thousands of multiple comparisons. That's why the P values need, be, need to be so low. And it is accepted and has been since this first study that you need to be five multiplied to minus eight to have genome-wide significance, okay? So you see this, this is very dense, lots of results, but still nothing out of it can be used clinically yet. Although we have really interesting risk scores here. Look at this. If you move, so this is again like choosing your parents. I know this is a flippant thing, but so as your genetic risk score goes up, yeah, and we know it clinically for many, many years, we've been asking patients in the clinic about family history. That's not new, yeah your risk goes up exponentially. And the same here, coronary, uh, sorry, cardiovascular disease all combined, myocardial infarction and stroke all goes in parallel with this genetic risk score. So this is useful, but doesn't yet help us to treat individual patient. So could we do something clever, maybe smaller study, more focused, perfectly formed, to be useful to patients. And this is the study we did a number of years ago in Glasgow, as it happens. And my colleagues and I um, had only 2,000 patients in each arm of the study, but we pre-selected them very carefully. So blood pressure is normally distributed in any population in the world that you look at. If you select very high, top 1.7%, as we've done, and bottom, 
you have so-called high risk and hyper controls, people with almost no risk. And that's what we've done. And that allowed us to see something really, really useful that is just one peak in entire Manhattan plot. So we could focus on something. And this peak, which was on human chromosome 16, happened through luck. But as we discussed yesterday with one of your colleagues, luck comes on prepared mind, yeah? So through luck, the gene was sitting in the, in the marker, sorry, the SNP, the marker, was sitting in the gene that the very name of the gene told us it has something to do with blood pressure control. So you can imagine excitement in the laboratory when we found out this result. So the gene was called uromodulin, uromodulin, and we knew very quickly by reading about it that it has to do with regulation of sodium homeostasis in the kidney. Must have to do with blood pressure, yeah? So we've gone, we, we had enough evidence to go into proper functional studies, and this is a knockout mouse, and you see that this knockout mouse where there is no uromodulin whatsoever, it's completely knocked out. There is big blood pressure difference in very precise measurement, we call radiotelemetry, indwelling catheter, very, very precise measurement. But even more importantly, all rodents and man, blood pressure goes up if you feed them salt. That's why in our population with chips and crisps, blood pressure is higher than it was 100 years ago. Um, these mice without uromodulin were completely flat. You can give them as much salt as you want and they're completely resistant to it. So excitement gone even larger and we were studying what we know about uromodulin and this is quickly summarized here. It had a different name, that's why it was a bit confusing. Tam horsefall protein. It's expressed in only one bit of the kidney, one group of cells here and nowhere else, which tells you again something really functionally important. And it is responsible for 25% of sodium reabsorption in the kidney. It is very abundant in the human and rodent urine, and it protects from urinary infections and kidney stones. So, just to show you how it looks, these are polymers, monomers, and it sits here interacting with very important sodium transporter and making it work differently. So we now were able to show that there are genetic differences in general population and in patients with hypertension, and that very small difference in one marker, one SNP, causes different excretion of this protein, but also different response to very frequently used drug, frisamide, a loop diuretic, that we teach students not to give to patients with uncomplicated hypertension. It's an error of prescribing if you give this to people with high blood pressure without kidney problems. So we were able to show that this single polymorphism has big blood pressure differences in Caucasian population, and that people respond differently, opposite response to this drug. So small difference, huge difference in physiological behavior. So I'm almost here. Uh, this allowed us to use this marker for precision medicine, like we did before in cancer. And we see here that there are two types of hypertension. People who have high umod hypertension are very salt sensitive, normal kidney function, and a good response to these drugs that we normally don't give in high blood pressure, and they're pretty common. And there is this opposite picture, like a mirror image, which is slightly more rare in our population. We therefore can now treat blood pressure that we can't treat with other drugs that are in the guidelines, we can treat better using this differentiation because we no longer treat everybody to be the same. We stratify, we do proper 
precision medicine clinical trial. And this trial is now ongoing, so I can't show you results. We used a different drug, not frusamide, but it's very, very similar, pharmacologically identical. But we're using it because it exists and it's no longer used, so we're repurposing very cheap drug that is you know, available for a few pence in the UK for this indication. And this is illustration that even if it is difficult, you can use precision medicine to do things better for patients. So I believe that we are ready for a prime time in the clinic. For majority of chronic diseases, just need to come together, work hard, and implement it first in the NHS, and maybe other health systems will do the same. I showed you mostly genomics, but I believe that you can integrate all the omics, and that would help even better. You need, you know, human being is very complicated, physiology and pathophysiology is complicated. The more information we have, the greater the clinical utility of what we do. So, of course, I like coming and talking about it, but the work is done by other people, and I need to acknowledge team in Glasgow and many, many colleagues around the world because these big studies require huge collaborations, and we are a bit like physics now with papers that have 100 and 200 co-authors. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you have some questions. Thank you.